some clips. <laughs> <laughs> but if not, we'll we'll have a you know a wonderful discussion nonetheless. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this final plenary event for the first day of BAPS 2021. I'm really delighted to be chairing this post-screening Q&A of the documentary film Independent Miss Craigie with filmmaker Lizzie Thin and researcher and associate producer Holly Price, both based at the University of Sussex. The film's already been made available in full uh, via a Vimeo link for all delegates, but um, fingers crossed Lizzie and Holly will also be screening some short excerpts as memory joggers and appetite wetters, as well as talking about their work. And then we'll uh, invite questions and comments from everybody present. And we can do that either by the hand raising function and people coming to the microphone and video to post their questions, or you can put something in the chat and I can read it out on your behalf. OK, uh, this film is one of many outputs from the incredibly productive AHRC supported project Jill Craigie Film Pioneer. And I'm really pleased that this session is sponsored by the British Cinema and Television Special Interest Group, and that we're showcasing this important feminist historical work. So without any more ado, I shall increase the bandwidth by switching my camera off and hand over to Lizzie Thin and Holly Price. So, Thank you very much, Melanie. Can everyone hear me OK? I hope they can. <laughs> um, uh, so um, thanks very much to Melanie for chairing and also um, to the British Film and Television SIG for sponsoring this uh, uh, Q&A and screening. Um, obviously, this film, I would have loved you to see it here on the big screen, but hopefully you've had the advantage of seeing it at your leisure and that will leave us some more time for discussion. So it's the first conference screening for this film to such a well-informed audience. So we're very much looking forward to your comments and feedback. And I hope you have had the chance to see it and that we can show you some clips bandwidth permitting. Uh, so. Me and Holly are just going to, the research fellow on the overall project, are just going to say a few words and then hopefully we'll show you some clips and there'll be some discussion. So the film is, uh, production is part of a larger project on Jill Craigie, um, as Melanie mentioned, um, who's support and supported by the HRC, whose support we'd like to acknowledge. Yes, um, I'm not sure why you can't see me, but um, I think it's maybe because screen um, Holly is screen sharing. Uh, so um, I think that's why you can't see me. I think we, we need to leave it like that, though. Um, um, I'm not sharing. I don't are you not? think. No. no, maybe it's me that's sharing. Hang on, I don't. I'm not sure. I tried to share and then I couldn't. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure. Oh, I do love teams. Um, <laughs> OK, uh, let me see. Oh, there we go. Right. OK, can you see me now? Yes, I hope so. Yes. OK, can. lovely. Sorry about this. Uh, we didn't have a, a lot of time to uh, try this out. Um, so this uh, this film is part of a larger project, as I said, which includes an issue of the Journal of British Film, uh, British Cinema and Television, edited by Holly and our co-investigators Yvonne Tasker and Sadie Waring. And there'll be an issue coming out from them uh, called Jill Craigie uh, and Women in British Film and Documentary Cultures, 1930 to 55, because we wanted to place Craigie within a wider context. And Yvonne and Tasker also writing a book on her that will come out. Uh, Yvonne and Sadie uh, will be writing that that's coming out in 2022. So um, just to say a few words about Craigie and the approach to the form and narrative of the film, which I directed and produced and for which Holly did much of the fantastic archive research, which she will talk a little bit about in a minute. So firstly, why Jill Craigie? She was, not, of course, as I said, not the only woman non-fiction director of the war or the post-war period. Several women worked in different sectors of non-fiction film, including propaganda, information films for the home front, 
um, and on topics of pressing concern as the war unfolded. Um, such as housing, which Craigie herself was very interested in, and women's recruitment to the war effort. Other women, such as Mary Field, um, who was known for natural history and children's films, Kay Manda, who made acclaimed documentaries and promotional films, and Sarah Arulka, who worked in corporate and advertising. So unlike these contemporaries, though, Craigie's work achieved a degree of critical recognition and was well reviewed in the 1940s when her main films were produced, as you saw in our documentary. And her films stand out because of their overtly feminist and socialist politics and their attempt to juggle activism and entertainment. She was one of the first British women to set up her own production company, Outlook Films, with William McQuitty in 1948 a pioneering decision which echoes the choices made by women producers today, often frustrated by corporate resistance to their talents. So there are some overall key issues which the project addresses and which I know a number of other researchers um, who've been speaking today, including Melanie Bell, Shelley Cobb, have also addressed in their projects. For instance, around how women's creativity can be conceptualized, narrated and recognized and also in showing how distribution and reception impact on the historical awareness of specific films. The primary emphasis of our project is not so much around claiming Craigie as an auteur, but looking at how the context of production, distribution and reception, as, wide, as well as wider gender politics, impacted her career and her place in film histories. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about my approach to making the film, which is the key part of the project for which I was responsible. Along with Holly, as I, as I said, who worked with me on many aspects of the film, both in research and production. When I first approached her career, um, I, I thought of her trajectory as someone who made a handful of films in the 40s and early 50s and then ceased filmmaking from 1951 onwards until her surprising return to direct her final film in 1994, when she was 83. So this trajectory chimes with a view of women's history of opening up opportunities in the war period, followed by a closing down in the wake of the familialism of the 1950s. Obviously, there is some truth in this, but um, these always very partial accounts um, made quite a lot of generalizations about women's work, of course, especially in relation to class. But in Craigie's case, the picture was always more complex as it now no doubt was for many other women too. So not only did she work as a scriptwriter again after directing her campaigning film on equal pay, possibly her most contemporary in, in its feel, uh, To Be a Woman in 1951, but she wrote three highly successful features, The Million Pound Note, Wyndham's Way and Trouble in Store. And as other historians have noted, she continued pitching to direct for both television and cinema and lobbied to import feminist ideas into the new medium of television, the relatively new medium. So we were, we were fascinated to discover that she was in at the start of ITV, as you've seen in the very fuzzy archive of the ITV launch that we had in our film. There she appears to be the presenter of a show called Sunday Afternoon. Holly's research at the TV Times, however, revealed that she was in fact directing items for the show and therefore did gain experience in the medium, if not, it seems, in studio, studio production in the 50s. She wasn't commissioned to make more substantial documentaries, though, until she got commissioned in 1967 to make two films, Who Are the Vandals? on the impact of high-rise housing, focus on the Regent, Regent's Park housing estate, and the quirky film on new masculinities, which we discovered on BBC Genome, which follows posh young men with long hair, which was called Keep Your Hair On. So Holly discovered her less, less well-known interaction, interactions with the BBC in the fascinating files on her and her, on her production at BBC Written Archives Caversham. I think that at the suggestion of our dear chair, Melanie Williams, uh, we found this great material there. So I'm wondering now if I can show a clip, uh, Holly. Have you have you managed to? Um, yeah, it should be that fine. Um, oh, lovely. Thank how you. How long would you like to play it for? 
Well, I'll just tell you when to okay, stop cool. if that's okay. All right, it should so, work. Um, this clip um, shows the transitions in her career from scriptwriter to her involvement with television, an aspect of her working life which is much less well known than her work with Rank on her film documentaries in the 40s, which has received a little more critical, critical attention. So this is partly why I've chosen this clip, because it's because, as I say, it's a less well known part of her career. It starts, however, with a letter from Michael Balkan, which is well known from 1958, where he says he cannot employ her as a director in her response to in, in response to her pitch to him to make films focused on and addressed to women. People think I gave up directing films altogether from 1951. Well, that isn't quite true. I did try. I wrote to Michael Balkan, the head of Ealing Studios, in 1958. I suggested that, though hiring an angry young man might be more exciting, I could get under the skin of women characters. I told him that I'd written a couple of articles for the Evening Standard based on my daughter and her friends. The advertising managers were so delighted that I was offered the editorship of the women's pages, which I refused because I preferred films. Vulcan replied that he couldn't take up my suggestion, not least because, although he had recently lost some first-class directors, his slate was full with films to be directed by others already working for Ealing, such as Seth Holt. Once upon a time, when Britain was very rich, deep in the vaults of the Bank of England, there was more... I knew it was possible to make a political fable for our times in a popular film, even a funny film. Before approaching Balkan, I'd written scripts for two successful feature films, The Million Pound Note and Wyndham's Way, both directed by Ronnie Neem. You see, Mr. Garrett, my brother and I require this pretty, exquisite, unique little scrap of paper for a bet. Bet? Did you say a bet? Very important bet. Just when you astound me. I'm astounded at the purpose for which you require this note. I'm astounded that you should call it a, a scrap of paper. Allow me to draw your attention to the text. I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of one million pounds. Ronnie thought my script of the Million Pound Note was so good, he sent it to Gregory Peck, who said yes to the leading role of Henry Adams. Gregory was one of the first Hollywood stars to make a deal in Britain. I found him extremely attractive. I went to the set often, as I felt I still had a lot to learn about directing drama. I can only assume he's an eccentric millionaire. Eccentric millionaire? You put him at the back of the room. Go and attend him at once. I'm sorry, sir, but I cannot change the note. But it's all I have on me. All? Oh, please don't worry, sir. It's of no consequence, no consequence at all. We're most gratified that you should so much as step foot inside our little establishment. I wrote something sharper with Trouble in Store, with Norman Wisdom as a hapless shop worker in his first cinema role. Wisdom had loved my original script, but the finished film, directed by John Paddy Carstairs, was almost pure slapstick, with little left of the satire I'd intended about class politics. I took my name off the credits. People in the business thought I was mad. Out of action since September the 1st, 1939, television comes back to the BBC with a full-scale dress rehearsal exclusively filmed by Pathé News. I was bursting with ideas for the small screen. The BBC seemed to want me more often in front of the camera than behind it. They invited me onto panel show programmes such as Women's Viewpoint in 1951. They knew I could be relied on to be argumentative and play what they saw as devil's advocate. In one programme, I appeared in a discussion with the editors of women's magazines to argue that they are escapist, unreal and full of false values.
commercial television is here. Among those who will bring the new programs to you are Sir John Barbirolli, Orson Welles, and Jill Craigie, among many other well-known personalities. When commercial television launched, at least I got to make a regular report for the Sunday afternoon show about some of the jobs women do, in case no one had noticed. I was still writing to the BBC in the 1960s with ideas. Hugh Weldon, the controller of programmes, finally got me in to see the head of documentaries in 1967. When Who Are the Vandals was broadcast, they were still trailing me as Britain's first woman film director. Good afternoon, ladies. Do you mind if I interrupt you? The rent collector? <laughs> no, my, my name is John Chisholm, and uh, I'm an architect. And what I'd like to do is talk to you about the, about the housing scheme here. Do any of you live in it? Yes. You do? Yes. What floor are you on? Ninth. On the ninth? ninth Have you got, floor, you, yes. This is your little girl, is it? Yes. So is it convenient for you up there or no? Not really, not for the little one, no. She climbs at the windows and... It's dangerous? Mm, very dangerous, yes. And uh, she, she's nowhere to play up at that level. She has to come down to the ground here. Yes, and we've only got the one bedroom too, so she can't even play in a bedroom. I see. It looked at the problems of the huge Regent's Park housing estate in North London. I asked a young architect, John Chisholm, to speak to residents and planners about whether the design actually worked especially for women and children. We were recreating entire neighborhoods without much neighborliness and setting the seal on our future. The mayor claimed that I'd staged the boys' vandalism for the camera and pinched the children climbing the stairs to make them cry. Well, of course, I didn't. Times had changed. The new trend was for fly-on-the-wall filming, catching things only as they happened, as if that was the only way to tell the truth. <laughs> so Craigie was probably the most photographed uh, director uh, of the period. Um, and uh, she, she was highly visible. There was a range of photographs taken for the press and for publicity. And the various extant images that you saw in the film show her shooting on set, doing research on location and posed in various domestic and studio interiors. Um, and as we show in the film, her, her glamour portraits of the 40s fetishise her good looks. And this was both an advantage and a disadvantage. Her image coming over as that of a star rather than a director. And when on location, she often appears as the only woman in a large crew of men, the only other female crew member being the continuity supervisor. Um, so in making the film, I wanted to juxtapose this specularization with Craigie's own voice, but the recovery of this, course, of course, this voice, of course, was not straightforward. The main professionally recorded interviews about her career held by the British Entertainment History Project by Toby Haggis and Rodney Giesler were done in 93 and 95 respectively, a few years before her death in 99. Um, and these for various reasons, while being very revealing in lots of ways, only focus on her last, on her first two films made for Rank, Out of Chaos and The Way We Live from 44 and 46 respectively. And in these and in later television interviews, Craigie shows a very disparaging attitude to her own work, often saying that she didn't really know what she was doing so this, there was a distinct split apparent from our research between the older Craigie's presentation of herself in these interviews as intensely self-critical and the assertive, apparently confident voice that emerges from her letters and production documents of the 40s and 50s, especially ones found in the suitcase denote, donated to us by Matt Foote, which, as I explained in my statement for the film, became a motif for our documentary. So I decided to interweave these two voices, as you saw in the film, and counterpoint the actual voice of Craigie in her recorded speech with the overtly performed delivery of Hayley Atwell as she reads the scripted narration based on the director's letters and documents. And this narration is mainly based on Craigie's words and ideas with some narrativization, mimicking Craigie's own approach, for instance, in both The Way We Live and Blue Scar, 
where the dialogue is based on Craigie's, Craigie's research with the respective communities, as she describes in the text we use to explore the making of those films. So her use of developed dramatised narratives is one of the aspects which stand out in her films compared to other films of the documentary movement, such as Fires Were Started and Nightmail, which use the relevant social actors to perform their everyday activities, but not in the form of a structured narrative, such as the one Craigie uses in The Way We Live. Craigie's statements in press releases were often performative, related to the context, context in which they were uttered, as indeed are all interviews, just as her later recollections of her life, such as being a member of, the air, of air raid protection and her career, were inflected by cultural memory of the war, of the nation pulling together and class and gender barriers being broken. And such a discourse is characteristic of wartime fiction films, such as The Gentle Sex, as Penny Summerfield notes. It is also evident in the compelling propaganda films, such as Elsa Dunbar's production, Britannia is a Woman, from 1940, made for British movie tone, which I juxtapose with Craigie's feelings about war work. Um, her work remained driven throughout her career by her politics, as it always had been, and when her feminism could not be expressed in films or television, she wrote columns for the standard which addressed the contradictions of 50s femininity, caught, like Craigie herself, between domesticity and aspirations for creative and fulfilling work. Okay, I'll stop there and hand over now to Holly. Hi everyone, um, I guess you might be able to tell I don't use Teams very often, um, but I'm the research fellow on the Jill Craigie Film Pioneer Project. Um, my background is in researching British film and cultural history. I completed my PhD on 1940s British cinema at Queen Mary, and I was previously a postdoctoral research fellow on the AHRC funded Ministry of Information Project where I worked on the MOI's films division in wartime. So the Craigie project was very up my street. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed watching Independent Miss Craigie. I worked on the archival research for it, which was such a brilliant experience. And I'll be very happy to talk about the archives we've drawn on and my approaches to researching Craigie's wide ranging work, um, if you have any questions about them. Ahead of the q and I'm just going to very briefly mention some of the aspects of Craigie's career that have arisen out of my research on the film. And first of all, is her community-based uh, approach to filmmaking. So in particular with the local projects she directed in the 1940s. So the way we live in Plymouth and Blue Scar in South Wales. Both, as we've shown in our film, relied on a participatory film practice, which involved a collaborative approach to exploring nationwide processes of reconstruction in, like based in regional and industrial working class communities. Um, alongside her filmmaking, Craigie delivered a series of film reviews for the BBC in the late 1940s, where she praised indigenous films, as she called them, and what she meant by that was social realist films with real people and real environments. And these reviews are also intriguing because she very candidly critiqued the way she felt the film industry was pandering to the box office, as she put it. However, as you saw in the film, she was nevertheless working within this very industry and aiming to reach mass audiences with her films. So, for instance, she dreamt she dreams of the stars who would appear as leading suffragettes in her planned feature film in the hope that the resulting uh, spectacular feminist epic would be accepted by major distributors. Craigie could sometimes be critical of mass culture and uh, particularly of escapist cinema made with all the usual stock ingredients like the romantic narrative, star names and slinky, Cyronic leading lady, which are mocked in the satirical trailer for Blue Scar that Lizzie's recreated in the film from a draft script that we found. However, the portraits of girlhood in Craigie's two local films were distinctively influenced not only by the documentary realist tradition, but also by contemporary popular culture's promotion of youthful femininity, selfhood and glamour. Indeed, 
Craigie's work often seemed to fuse her socialist feminist politics with shifting popular ideas about feminine modernity. From her contributions to debates on early women's television programmes that promoted women's roles both in public and at home, to her 1958 letter to Michael Balkan, suggesting that she make a feature film version of the hugely popular magazines for teenage girls at that time. I've recently uh, written a journal article which will be coming out in a future issue of Screen, which explores how Craigie's local films distinctively foreground the individual experiences of young women as part of their explorations of communities undergoing post-war change. So, for example, in the scene centering on Alice Copperwheat's thoughts on her night out when she's jitterbugging with the GIs in The Way We Live, and Olwyn's dreams of escaping the mining community to become a singer in Blue Scar. So by drawing on evidence of these films, local production and reception, I argue that they can be reassessed as contrib contributing to an evolving tradition of British social realism, identified by scholars here actually, including Melanie Williams, Lucy Bolton, Anna Coatman and So Mayer. And it's a tradition of social realism that foregrounds young women's stories. And I suggest that these post-war girlhoods on screen were simultaneously shaped by contemporary anxieties and ambivalences surrounding such figures in this period. So the film showcases a lot of Craigie's known career in the film industry, as well as beyond it in journalism, television, activism, and feminist scholarship, but also some of the unmade projects she worked on behind the scenes, archival research of which has been hugely revealing for understanding how her career developed and also might have developed had these projects come to fruition. As Shelley Cobb emphasises, unmade films have an important role in our research of women filmmakers' careers and a history of their own that the project team has been exploring and which is particularly pertinent in the case of Craigie's unmade or, or uncompleted projects about the women's suffrage movement. Uh, so, as Lizzie mentioned, uh, during my research for the film at the BBC's Written Archive Centre, I uncovered plans for a dramatised documentary about the suffragettes that Craigie wrote for the BBC's early post-war television service. And her script focuses on the militant career of, of Charlotte Marsh, who was actually one of the first suffragettes to have been force-fed while in prison. Um, in the event, Craigie's script was used but rewritten and she withdrew from the television production following negative responses of ex-suffragettes to her radio play about the movement. And I'll be speaking more about that um, in the media activism and social attitudes session on Friday. So it would be lovely to see people there too. Um, but back to independent Miss Craigie. And before we open up for questions, I wanted to just show a quick clip, which is taken from the chapter on Blue Scar, uh, which introduces some of Craigie's ideas on getting to women in the mining community and the film's focus on uh, miners' daughter, Olwyn, particularly. So hopefully this will work out. While miners didn't gain significant control of their industry, conditions and safety were improved. Pithead baths meant women had less work to wash the men at home, but not all pits benefited straight away. I wrote to the coal board that I hoped the film would get to the women in mining areas by helping them to feel proud of being connected with miners and mining. Four sons to baths, and all I've got left is two sticks of shaving. I see if mum's got any spare. Ah, oh, well, you'll be out of it all in Cardiff. You won't be coming back here. Well, not to live, maybe. But usually you find that the daughter of a miner was brought up on the dole. She doesn't want her husband to be a miner, to see him broken by silicosis. She visualizes herself doing washing day after day, a chore without end. She often works in a big town and sees an entirely different type of life there. Can you blame her for wanting a collar and tie husband in these circumstances? 
You dream of a future in mining, but you haven't the eyes to see your own valley. Look at the streets. Look at the houses. There's nothing here, absolutely nothing. Alwyn, be quiet. There's a kind of spirit in the valley. Everyone feels it. You feel it too. It's something that keeps us together. You won't find that anywhere else in the whole world, least of all in the big cities. That's me done, I think, Lizzie. Great. Thanks, Holly. Thanks very much. That's okay. We, we're, we're over then. Well done for, for getting us. <laughs> Nevertheless, she persisted. It's not only true of Jill Crow, it's <laughs> also true of you. So well done. Um, so questions, comments are welcomed either through raising your hand or using the chat function. Um, 